Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and a very good afternoon to all of you. Um, what I want to talk about today is, uh, of course, I, I will talk about technology readiness, but a little bit later. Uh, first, I want to give you a broad overview of some of my uh, you know, earlier work in the domain of customer service and quality of service. And as some of you might know, uh, much of this work has been uh, supported by uh, the Marketing Science Institute, which is a uh, major uh, uh, nonprofit organization in the United States, supported by about uh, 75 or so Fortune 500 companies. And the main goal of the Marketing Science Institute is to, uh, is to uh, uh, look at issues that are of keen interest to managers in companies and get academics like myself to do research on those topics to generate some new ideas and new concepts. And one of the key areas that has been of keen interest to the Marketing Science Institute for a long time now is uh, quality of service and customer service. So the last 25 years or so, I've been doing some major research projects uh, to understand what service quality really means uh, and what are some other things that might get in the way of service quality and how can companies measure and improve uh, quality of service. My more recent work, uh, as was uh, said during the introduction, focuses on uh, the role of technology in, in service delivery. So I'm going to talk about both pieces, quality of service and, and uh, 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 technology. Um, I'm going to start out with this uh, Business Week uh, cover story. Uh, that uh, you know, that uh, the title of the story is "Why Service Stinks," and then you see this guy pulling out his hair. Uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is that this particular thing uh, appeared over 10 years ago, and and uh, unfortunately, even today, I'm sure at least some of us sometimes feel this way in terms of getting service, right? Feel like pulling our hair out. So even though you know this uh, this uh, topic of quality of service has been uh, uh, of, of uh, extreme importance, extreme importance for the past 25 years, still there's a long way to go in terms of companies being able to really deliver superior service. So what exactly is uh, service quality? Uh, this is where we started our research program 25 years ago, and we've done a lot of consumer focus group interviews as well as a lot of investigations of companies in a variety of different sectors, such as credit card services, banking services, hotel services, uh, uh, insurance uh, services, repair services, a whole host of different areas we've looked at, both from the customer's perspective and uh, from the company's perspective. And uh, what we are finding is that from the customer's perspective, uh, service quality results from a comparison, a mental comparison that they make of what excellent companies should be delivering by way of service and what they actually perceive a given company as, as delivering. And typically, and typically there is a disconnect between what they expect excellent service to be and what they actually perceive a given company to be delivering. And uh, what our results uh, show in terms of uh, a company's perspective is that um, Delivering superior service on a, on a consistent, sustained basis is a major challenge for most companies. You know, occasionally they might be able to deliver excellent service, but to do it consistently well is becoming a major challenge. And our results, are, our, our findings also show that the reason this major challenge arises is because of several organizational deficiencies within, uh, within companies. So uh, putting these two perspectives together, both the customer's perspective and the company's perspective, we developed the so-called uh, GAPS model of service quality. Some of you may have uh, seen this model, GAPS model of, of service quality, or the PZB uh, model, or PZB, I guess, in some other languages. <laughs> PZB model, it's the same model. Uh, and uh, basically, from the customer's perspective, the service quality gap occurs of the disconnect between customers' expectations and their, and their perceptions. Now, if you label that uh, uh, gap, gap five, uh, what our research consistently shows is that there are four major organizational deficiencies, gaps one through four, within organizations 
uh, that in turn result in GAP5. And uh, here's a little bit more elaboration on what those, what those gaps are. There's a market information gap, which is a disconnect uh, between what customers' expectations really are and the management's or organization's understanding of those expectations. Uh, then there is the service standards gap, which is a disconnect between whatever knowledge executives in a company might have about customers' expectations and the extent to which the actual specifications or standards for the service reflect managers' understanding of those expectations. Uh, the service delivery gap or the service performance gap is the gap between the standards, organizational standards for service and the actual delivery. And then finally, we have the internal communication gap here, which is the gap between uh, what is being delivered to customers, which is what affects their perceptions, right? Uh, and what is actually communicated to customers about what the service is going to be. You know, typically there is a disconnect here, particularly between the operations department or operations function, which is supposed to deliver the service to customers, and the marketing function, which is typically in charge of promoting the service. There's a disconnect. And there are other kinds of organizational internal communication disconnects as well. So let me uh, take a minute to talk about each of these uh, gaps, give you some examples to illustrate these gaps. First gap is the market information gap. Uh, to give you an example of this gap, let me use a personal experience. Uh, I stay at uh, a lot of different hotels around the world in a number of different countries. And uh, a few years back, I was staying at a major four-star hotel in Madrid, Spain. Uh, and after going up to my room, one of the things that attracted my attention uh, in the room was a menu that they had kept on the, on the bed. Now, first, I thought this was a breakfast menu. But upon examining this closely, I discovered that it was not a breakfast menu, but it was actually a menu for pillows. It was a menu for pillows that offered uh, 10 different pillows, a choice of 10 different pillows for customers. It was described both in English and, and in Spanish. Uh, actually, this is the actual copy of the pillow menu, in case you're wondering if I'm just making this up. Uh, so, so they had this pillow menu that offered a choice of, as you can see, nine or ten different pillows. And the pillow menu said, we really want to, want to treat you as a very valued customer, therefore we are offering you a choice. So my immediate reaction upon seeing the pillow menu was one of excitement. I had never seen anything like that before, so I was all pumped up to get excellent service. But as I started experiencing the basic service uh, of the hotel, almost every little thing that could go wrong did go wrong. Uh, for example, I had asked for a wake-up call the next morning, never got the wake-up call. Uh, you know, there was a series of failures, you know, fatal failures like this. But they had a pillow menu, right? So this is a classic illustration of this market information gap. Uh, in a lot of companies, they think they are providing good service, but that good service is based on assumptions uh, that don't really match customers' real expectations. Uh, so not understanding customers' basic expectations is one of the major problems of poor service quality. Um, and another problem here related to this particular gap is that you know, if you think of the expense of offering the service, it's just a mind-boggling amount of expenditure that companies have to invest, right? Somebody, you have to have a space where you have to store all these pillows. A lot of inventory carrying costs, right? A lot of labor costs associated with carrying these pillows back and forth. It's a logistical nightmare that you have to deal with. Uh, and yet, you're failing on the basic things that customers are expecting. So there is a total disconnect between what customers' expectations really are and what, what uh, companies' understanding of those expectations are. So uh, one of the key questions that companies should ask is, do we have an accurate understanding of what customers' expectations really are? And if the answer is not really, or we're not really sure what customers' expectations are, uh, then you are going to have customers that are like this. Yeah. Service uh, standards gap, an example. Favorite example of mine again. Uh, 
uh, uh, some of you might know, I live in Miami, uh, and Miami International Airport uh, uh, is, is pretty much dominated by American Airlines. Uh, you know, they control about 75 to 80 percent of all the flights. Uh, so uh, I really don't have a choice. When I have to fly out of Miami, uh, I have to use American Airlines. Now, American Airlines might think that I'm a very loyal customer, <laughs> but I'm, I'm more like a prisoner. And a lot of companies are that way. They think that, oh, we have loyal customers. They come back to us every time, but, but they are really prisoners because they don't have many, many other options. But anyway, to illustrate this, the standards gap, I want to give you uh, an example. I have all kinds of problems with American Airlines, with the various aspects of their service. I just want to give one illustration which has to do with the baggage uh, uh, service. And again, there are a whole host of problems associated with baggage uh, service. I, I, for example, on a typical American Airlines flight, it takes anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to get the bags after you, after you arrive. But anyway, the, the, the example that I want to give here is that uh, last year, uh, American Airlines installed this, uh, these flat screen TV monitors uh, uh, in front of every baggage carousel. And uh, the, the thing that is really mind-boggling is the information they put on that screen had nothing to do with customer service. For example, what is the information they put on the screen? Information they put on the screen is flight so-and-so has arrived at such and such a time. <laughs> now think about it as a customer waiting for your bag uh, what good is it for you to be told that your flight has already arrived? You know that, right? <laughs> you just got off the flight. So that is useless uh, information. What might be more valuable to put on the screen in terms of service specification or standards is, when is my bag going to arrive? You know, what is the status of my bag? Has the bag been unloaded from the plane? Is it on the way to the baggage claim area or is there a problem? You know, that kind of information will be a lot more useful. So a lot of companies have, you know, they might have an understanding of what customer's expectations are. I'm sure that American Airlines knows, American Airlines knows that customers are, get frustrated when they don't know when their bag is going to arrive. So that knowledge is there. But how they translate that into specifications is a total disconnect. The third gap. Again, uh, an example that all of us can identify this. McDonald's. Uh, a very successful uh, company. Can anybody from McDonald's here? <laughs> so this is uh, McDonald's from the USA, not here. So, <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, uh, McDonald's, uh, you know, is, is, uh, has been very duly credited by, uh, by sort of inventing standardization, so to speak, in the fast food industry. I mean, they're like the creators of the standards. Uh, for, for fast food delivery. They've got standards for almost every little aspect of preparing and delivering and serving uh, 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 fast food, right? Uh, so about six years ago, McDonald's had a lot of problems in the US. Uh, they had so many problems that the Wall Street Journal had an article uh, where the title of the article really gives a good summary of what the problems they are facing. The title of the article is McDonald's finds angry customers on its menu. And the article went on to describe that McDonald's own internal surveys showed at that time, six years ago, that on a typical uh, uh, day, about 10% of the customers of McDonald's were experiencing some problem that was serious enough for them to call the company and complain, complain to the company. And what were some of those complaints? The top five complaints were the following. Rude employees, which goes exactly against the specifications for service. You know, their internal specification says we should serve our customers with a smile. In fact, their marketing communications, all of their advertisements, uh, you know, at least in the U.S. said we'd love to serve, serve you with a smile. And then there was a big smiley face on all of their ads. The number one complaint was your employees are rude. Your stores are not clean. And again, McDonald's has you know, 15 different steps for how often the bathroom should be cleaned. Uh, or, you know, how to cl clean the floor. So all of the things that the customers were complaining about were things for which McDonald's already had the standards. 
But for some reason, the actual delivery of the service was falling short. And this again happens in a lot of companies. There are standards for service, but a lot of times the people that are supposed to deliver the service aren't even aware of what the standards are, let alone meet those standards. That's gap three. All right, now the last gap, the internal communication gap. Again, let me use an example I think most of you will be able to identify with. Uh, this is Sears. Anybody from Sears here? <laughs> you are from Sears? Okay. <laughs> saying that as a straight face too. My name is Sears. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, Sears uh, is the leading, one of the leading uh, retailers in, in America, North America. Uh, and they also provide a lot of repair service. They sell a lot of appliances like washing machines, uh, 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 microwave ovens, television sets, uh, and so on. And they provide, they are the major provider of repair service uh, on a national basis for these kinds of appliances. And yet, again, based on a personal example, um, our washing machine just earlier this year uh, at our home broke down. And so we called Sears, and somebody from Sears came and did something, and it started working. And as soon as that person left, you know, it broke down again. Uh, and then we called. So another person came two days later. Again, they don't come immediately, right? You got to wait two days. Another person came uh, and did something, and it started working. The person left, it broke down again. <laughs> and to cut a long story short, this is a true story. It took eight different service calls before they finally fixed the, they thought they fixed the washing machine. It broke down again after the eighth time. Then finally they ended up replacing the machine, gave us a new machine. Now, of course this uh, looks almost uh, 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 unrealistic, but true. But the point I want to make here is that every time some repair person would come, that person would not have any idea about who was there before and what was done to the machine. This service call was like a new call. There was no internal coordination of what was done. And this, again, is a major problem in many companies. For example, when sometimes when you have a problem with your credit card or something, you call the credit card company. The person that answers the phone might say, oh, uh, sorry, sir, uh, I cannot help you, but I will transfer you to some other department. So they transfer you to some other department, and you have to tell your whole story again. <laughs> You would have already told the first person the story, but uh, again, you have to repeat yourself. So this, again, is a lack of internal uh, communication. In this case, particular case, Sears really didn't make any money on this. I mean, I'm sure they lost a lot of money on this washing machine. Plus, they also frustrated the customer. So it's, it's, uh, this is a major problem. Uh, different touch points, different people, Different interfaces that may all touch the same customer aren't well coordinated internally. Uh, that not only frustrates customers in terms of poor service quality, but also eats up a lot of resources internally. And turn them into customers like that. You know, this is a, my business week, not, not business week story. So I just, you for, Photoshop to change this guy to that. Uh, okay. uh, so, so the basic idea is that you need to systematically look internally within the company, close these gaps one through four, which in turn will close the gap five, and you have happy customers. It's as simple as that, and it's as complicated as that. So the reason why the you know, quality of service doesn't improve is that companies still don't take the initiative to systematically analyze and correct these internal gaps. And again, in the, you know, later on we can talk about why this is the case, but this is the case. And companies don't realize that poor service quality is actually a very expensive proposition. Not only is it bad for the customer because you're frustrating the customer, but it's also bad for the company because you're wasting resources. Poor service quality is expensive. Contrary to what managers think. Very, very expensive. So this GAS model provides you with a conceptual framework for conceptualizing uh, what service quality means from the customer's perspective and what are some other problems that might lead to poor service quality. Uh, in uh, labor studies, uh, we have uh, developed this uh, surf wall approach. Again, some of you may have heard about this term surf wall which is basically an approach or an instrument for measuring this 
gap five, which is the external service quality gap. Gap five or external service quality gap. And again, some of you might already know this. Uh, the third wall tries to measure the expectation versus possessions gap on these five uh, different attributes. Again, very quickly, uh, tangibles has to do with all of the visual aspects associated with the service. The appearance of the facilities, appearance of the personnel delivering the service, appearance of brochures or other communication materials, uh, and so forth. Uh, reliability has to do with uh, keeping your service promises, ability to provide the promised service dependably and, and accurately. Uh, responsiveness has to do with uh, the speed of the service, promptness of the service, as well as the general willingness to help uh, uh, customers. Uh, assurance oops, has, to, has to do with uh, knowledge and courtesy of employees and their ability to inspire trust and confidence. This has to do with the behavior of employees in terms of being able to win over the trust of the customers, earning the trust of the customer is a highly human intensive kind of a thing. And that's what assurance refers to. And likewise, empathy focuses on employee behavior and refers to the caring, individualized attention the firm delivers to its customers. Empathy has to do with putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Uh, and that, again, is a, is, a, uh, is a function of employee behavior. And what this chart shows is, again, we, we've uh, done uh, a number of different surveys in a variety of industries using the circle approach. Uh, and one of the things that has been consistently true based on these surveys is that when we ask customers to rate the relative importance of these five attributes, reliability always gets the most weightage. And again, reliability has to do with simply keeping the service promises that you make. Being reliable in a service context simply means if a company promises to do something, does it do so? And as you can see here, the least critical dimension is the tangibles, the appearance aspects. This doesn't mean that tangibles is not important. Tangibles is still important, but in a relative sense, the most critical dimension is reliability. All the others come after that. Another important uh, concept that has emerged from other studies that we've done uh, relates to the nature of customers' expectations. Again, remember that the definition of quality of service from the customer's perspective is this gap between what they expect a company to deliver and what they actually perceive a company is delivering. So because expectations are really the standards, customer expectations are really the standards against which a company's performance gets judged. Therefore, to better understand the nature or the composition of customers' expectations, we did a number of qualitative research studies using consumer focus group interviews. And one of the key ideas to emerge from that qualitative research is this idea of zone of tolerance. The zone of tolerance simply says that customers' expectations, rather than existing at a high ideal level only, as a single level, it actually spans a range of performance levels, a range of performance levels uh, that is bounded, that is that has an upper boundary which you are calling desired service. The desired service is the level that customers believe can and should be delivered. It's almost like a realistic ideal. You know, ideally, customers believe that this is the level that excellent companies should be able to deliver and can deliver if they really try. But then, most customers are also quite reasonable. This was very, very clear from focus group interviews that we did in a number of different uh, sectors, that customers are, in fact, very reasonable. They are willing to cut companies a certain degree of slack, so to speak, give some flexibility to com companies to deliver the service, up to a point. And that lower boundary is what we are calling adequate service, or the minimum level with which they are likely to be satisfied. So the zone of tolerance is really the range of expectations uh, within which if the company's performance falls, then customers are going to be reasonably satisfied. Now, we've taken, uh, you know, based on the knowledge that we gained from this research that produces zone of tolerance, we took our initial surf wall uh, instrument and refined it, and refined it to be able to measure, uh, measure the desired level of service, 
to measure the adequate level of service on each of those five dimensions of service quality, uh, as well as the perceived level of service. So the, the current version of the surf wall approach uh, provides enough data to be able to depict or show the zone of tolerance and then show the company's performance relative to the zone. In other words, it measures the desired level of service, the minimum level of service, and the actual or, or perceived level of service for each of the five dimensions. <clears throat> this chart uh, summarizes uh, some of the actual results that we obtained using this refined circle approach. Uh, now first, uh, I want to talk about this. By the way, this retail chain, in case you're curious, is Sears, your company. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay. <laughs> this is, uh, this is uh, actual results. These uh, red dots here uh, refer to service quality uh, perception. So just the perception scores. Remember, the refined service quality instrument measures three different things. The desired level, the minimum level, and the perceived level. What you see on this chart is just the perceived level. In other words, the customer's assessment, customer's assessment of what uh, the quality of service is. And as you can see from this chart, uh, for the five dimensions, on average, the perceived performance is right around seven. On a scale of one to nine, the average perceived performance is one to one to seven. Just looking at this, like you, <laughs> you'd, you'd probably say, this is not bad, right? <laughs> you'd say, this is not bad because you have around seven on a nine point scale. Of course, you can try and improve some more, but, but it's okay. You're, you're you know, two points over the midpoint of the scale. Yeah. Uh, so you are, you are consistently good on all of the five attributes. And this is what you normally will do as a manager. You'll say, oh, everything is fine. But when you superimpose a zone of tolerance on this, this is what the picture looks like. These are, again, the actual results. As you can see from here, when you superimpose and you add the zone of tolerance information, which basically is a representation of what customers' expectations are, then you're not going to pat yourself on the back as a manager, right? This is a completely different interpretation than the previous one. So again, just to emphasize, you know, if you look at only perceptions of, of customers, you're likely to be misled as a manager, thinking that everything is fine, uh, then in fact, when you take into account the customer's expectations as well, uh, you get a completely different interpretation. So an important point to make here is that <clears throat> if you want to assess the quality of service as experienced by customers, you need to have some understanding of what their expectation levels are. You know, just looking at how much of a rating they give you on a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 5, whatever, is not going to give you complete information. In fact, it might give you misleading information. Okay, now I want to uh, <clears throat> move into the second part of my presentation, which has to do with technology, uh, technology readiness and so forth. Uh, but as background for that, let me introduce this so-called uh, triangle model of, of uh, services marketing, which uh, some of you may have seen in textbooks and so forth. Uh, this triangle model of services marketing simply says that um, uh, when what you're delivering is a service as opposed to a physical product, uh, in addition to the traditional external marketing, the traditional external marketing refers to the, the marketing mix, the four Ps. You heard of the four Ps? Anybody here? Product, price, promotion, and place, or chance of distribution. So that's what external marketing is, okay? Yeah. Uh, so if you're, if you're, if you're uh, selling a product, if you're selling something like this, you have something physical, uh, so you can produce the product first, and then you can come up with a promotional strategy, you can come up with the price, you can come up with the chance of distribution, and you can sell it. But when what you're delivering is a service, you still have the four Ps. You still have to come up with the price for the service, you have to promote the service and everything else. But in addition to external marketing, you also need good internal marketing. Internal marketing has to do with you know, making your own employees, especially frontline employees, believers in your company. In other words, you want your frontline employees to be able to be happy about you as a company, have to be loyal to your company so that they can in turn provide good service to customers. You know, if you have employees that are unhappy, 
with the company, you cannot expect them to deliver good interactive marketing. So the triangle model simply says that if what you're delivering is a service, you need to go beyond the traditional external marketing and also include internal marketing and interactive marketing. Nowhere your technology shows up. Uh, although we all know that customers and employees are increasingly interacting with companies through technology. Uh, the most obvious form of technology is the internet, right? And there are other kinds of technologies that serve as intermediaries in the interactions that occur among the three parties. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so, so what I did was, uh, you know, about 15 years ago, I came up with a modification uh, for the triangle model, basically arguing that uh, because of the increasing role of technology in, in service delivery, we need to go from a two-dimensional plain uh, uh, triangle model to more of a three-dimensional pyramid uh, model, you know, convert the triangle to a pyramid uh, with, uh, with technology at the apex, at the center of the, of the pyramid. So I converted the triangle model to a pyramid model to emphasize the increasing role of technology in the interactions that occur among the three parties. An important implication of the, of the pyramid model is that an organization's ability to use technology effectively in marketing to and serving customers critically depends on the technology readiness of its customers and its employees. In other words, basically what this is saying is that even though more and more companies are introducing technology-based systems primarily as a way of cutting costs. You know, companies introduce technology because they believe it's more efficient. It's more efficient to deliver services through technologies rather than through people, right? So the underlying motivation in many companies is uh, to deliver services through technology. But an important piece that companies don't think about often is that are your employees and customers equally ready to use those systems? That's where technology readiness comes in. So here's a formal definition of technology readiness. Technology readiness refers to people's propensity to embrace and use new technologies for accomplishing goals in home life and at work. In other words, technology readiness has to do with the mental attitudes and the mental readiness of customers to enthusiastically adopt technology-based systems. And what our studies show in a number of different sectors again is that not all customers are equally mentally ready. You know, technology readiness refers to mental readiness. It's not a measure of technical competence, it's a measure of mental attitudes and mental readiness. Not all people are equally mentally ready to embrace and use those systems. And based on this initial idea of technology readiness, uh, again, I've done a uh, lot of quantitative studies and developed uh, a, a measure of this mental readiness called the Technology Readiness Index, or TRI. The Technology Readiness Index uh, consists of uh, uh, four uh, dimensions, uh, optimism, innovativeness, discomfort, and insecurity. These four di dimensions together uh, contribute to the overall technology readiness of, of, of people. Um, let me just briefly explain what these, what these components are. Optimism and innovativeness uh, are, are contributors to people's technology readiness. By optimism, I'm referring to a general positive view that technology is a good thing. Uh, and not all of us as consumers or as people uh, are equally enthusiastic in believing that technology is a good thing, not very positive views. Innovativeness has to do with uh, a willingness to try new things. And again, some of us are very, very uh, eager to try new things. Uh, others are very, very reluctant. We'll be the last to try uh, new things. For example, some of us will stand in line in front of an Apple store for 48 hours to buy the next iPad, right? Whereas others might think, what kind of idiots are these? They're not standing in line for 48 hours. And then on the other side, uh, we have uh, a couple of dimensions, discomfort and insecurity. These are inhibitors. These are inhibitors to technology readiness, meaning that people that uh, are high, score high on discomfort and insecurity will have lower 
uh, TR, technology readiness. Uh, discomfort has to do with uh, like an overall fear about technology, overall paranoia about technology. Somehow technology is controlling you rather than you being in control of the technology. Like all of us have one of these devices, right? Uh, and some of us have two or three, just to show off maybe. <laughs> but, uh, but the problem is, uh, this is a very good device, very convenient, but then the problem is it's, it's welded to us. It's welded to us and a lot of times we feel like, what is the quality of life? You know, this is 24 seven, it's constantly vibrating or ringing or whatever. Uh, uh, so, so that's the discomfort part, you know. Overall, people differ in the amount of discomfort they experience. Like, like insecurity is also fear, uh, but it's more transaction-specific fear. For example, if you do online banking, uh, will some of your accounts get mixed up? You prefer to go to the bank counter and do your transactions there. So that's the insecurity. Um, as I said, we have developed a technology readiness index scale to measure people's positions on these four different components. And uh, again, without going into a lot of the details, we have used the scores on these four different components to see if we can segment customers. If we can, we actually use the technical of the cluster analysis. That some of you that are mathematically oriented might know this technique. Uh, we did cluster analysis of the scores on the four components. And uh, we have come up with five segments of customers. Uh, based on the cluster analysis. And these five segments have distinct profiles based on their scores on the four uh, dimensions of uh, technology readiness, or TR scores. Okay, just to illustrate a couple of these segments, uh, explorers, for example, they have high scores on optimism, high scores on innovativeness, low scores on discomfort, and low scores on insecurity. In other words, they are high on the contributors and low on the inhibitors. So naturally, you know, they are very, very positive and very, very prone to adopting uh, technologies. Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you take uh, somebody like Pioneers, Pioneers is an interesting group. Just like explorers, they are high on optimism and high on innovativeness, but they are also high on discomfort and high on insecurity. So they are kind of schizophrenic. You know, like a, they have a personality disorder. They've got both positive, high on positives, and uh, high on the negatives. Uh, and some of us might fit that category. You know, we, are very, we, feel, we feel I certainly would fit that pioneer category because I, I, I really like my Blackberry smartphone. Uh, but sometimes I do wonder. You know, I do wonder what is this doing to my quality of life. Uh, so, and likewise, you can think of the other segment. We don't have time to go into details. But the main point here is that Based on these technology readiness scores, you can segment customers into these different groups. Now, in terms of service delivery to technology versus through humans, which is the key issue here in terms of customer service, uh, it follows from our discussion, previous discussion then, that um, when you look at <clears throat> the appeal of high-tech service channels, right, appeal of high-tech service channels and referring to the propensity of people to use technology-based systems to obtain service versus the appeal of high-touch service channels, which refers to propensity of people to go to human servers as opposed to technology servers, you can see that there's, there's a logical variation in the preference of these different groups. You know, explorers prefer have a high preference for high-tech channels. Laggards at the other end have a high preference for high-touch channels. And the others kind of fall in between. So an important implication here, again, we don't have time to discuss all the details, but, but I think an obvious implication is that when companies introduce technology-based systems for either their own employees or for their customers, they need to take into account the possibility that not all of their target individuals uh, would be equally ready. So they need to use more of a gradual approach or try to understand the technology readiness of their market segments of their own employees and then introduce technology-based systems on a gradual basis rather than on an overnight basis. So to conclude our discussion, uh, I've, I've developed an integrative framework for achieving excellence through superior service. 
uh, which looks uh, something like this. You know, let me just uh, go through this a little more quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, you know, to, to really deliver good quality service, either through technology or through human beings, these are the three major components that have to serve as a foundation. One is being reliable. As we saw, reliability is the most important dimension of quality of service. Uh, that's reliability, very critical. Secondly, you also need to have good systems of providing for providing effective service recovery. Service recovery has to do with the process that you use when customers are experiencing problems. And then a third component, which is a foundational component for delivering quality services, managing and exceeding customers' expectations. This managing customers' expectations has to do with keeping customer expectations under control. You know, don't offer a pillow menu, for example, when your basic service is bad because offering a pillow menu increases expectations rather than decrease expectations. So part of delivering high quality service is just controlling expe expectations and then trying to exceed those expectations. Okay, so, so here's the overall framework. And uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, the foundation pieces are here, the three building blocks, the three things that I mentioned. And then on top of that, I have this idea of turning marketing into a line function. Turning marketing into a line function simply says that marketing shouldn't be just the marketing department's responsibility, the four Ps, the traditional external marketing, but it should also be the responsibility of all employees and all technology-based interfaces that communicate with customers, regardless of what their functional affiliation is. For example, a bank teller in a bank might belong to the operations department. You may not even have any connection with the marketing department. But that bank teller has to behave like a marketing person. So that's what turning marketing to a line function really means. Making marketing everybody's responsibility, not just the marketing department's responsibility. And then if you do that, uh, then you can uh, uh, achieve, maximize your marketing potential. So I'll come back to this in another chart. It's, uh, it's just... So uh, just to explain this concept of turning marketing to a line function, uh, let's quickly go through this, what I call as marketing service grid. Marketing service grid is the two by two uh, matrix. Along the horizontal axis, uh, I have the amount of emphasis that a company places on external marketing, which is the traditional marketing. Either a high level of emphasis, which is an aggressive level, or a moderate level. And then on the vertical axis, I have quality of service, you know, the GAPS model and all the other things that we talked about earlier today. And again, let's just look at two different levels, either a mediocre level of service or a superior uh, level of service. Okay, and I would, I would argue, and I think most of you would agree, that you know, based on our own experiences, most companies, most companies would fall in this quadrant. You know, there's a lot of shouting, there's a lot of external marketing, but the quality of service is at best average. Uh, and uh, companies that fall in the lower right quadrant are actually engaging in a counterproductive strategy, right? Because basically what they are saying is they are shouting out loudly, asking customers to come in and sample their lousy service. They're basically saying, please come and experience our lousy service. <laughs> so that's what they're doing. Well, there are some companies that are in the lower left quadrant here. And those companies, unfortunately, because their you know, performance is not very good in the marketplace, have a temptation to all of a sudden you know, become aggressive in their external marketing in an attempt to improve their market performance. But what they should be doing, you know, if you, there are companies in the lower left quadrant, they need to try and move up instead of to the right. They need to go up here rather than move here. Uh, you know, normal tendency for most companies that are here is to fall into this counterproductive quadrant rather than try to move up. In other words, the optimum strategy, the optimum quadrant for a company to be on this grid is the upper left uh, quadrant, uh, where your quality of service is superior and you don't aggressively market your service. In fact, I would argue that if your quality of service is superior, you don't have to spend a lot of money on external marketing. Why? Because you have positive word of mouth communication, and customers, especially you know, in this day and age when we have social media, 
uh, uh, you know, good, good experiences of customers get shared with a lot of other customers through social networks. So that's why it's the optimum. Point. And lastly, I would say that when your quality of service is superior, uh, if you're also shouting loudly, wasting a lot of money on you know, advertising, you're, you're just overkilling. You're just throwing away money which you don't have to. Now, if you think about this, it all sounds very logical, but if you think about it, what we are really saying is that true marketing in a company has to be a line function. In other words, instead of spending all your money on aggressive external marketing, you take some of that money and improve your service from mediocre to superior. And how do you do that? You do that by investing more resources on internal marketing, training your own employees, and invest more money on interactive marketing. For example, if you're using technology to serve customers, make sure that those interfaces are very, very friendly and easy to use and all that. So marketing should become a line function more than simply a staff function. So uh, to conclude uh, our discussion, then let's take a second look uh, at this integrated framework. I've just added a few more arrows. Uh, it's the same picture as before. I've added a few more arrows, uh, starting with the bottom here really quickly. Uh, you know, doing the service right the first time, this has to do with service reliability. And if you do the service right the first time, that actually contributes uh, to service recovery. What I mean by that is that when you make very few mistakes, if you're reliable, then when the occasional mistake occurs, when you make a mistake, you can really invest a lot of resources to make sure that you provide excellent service recovery. On the other hand, if you're constantly making mistakes, which means your reliability is poor, you won't have the resources to do a good job of providing excellent recovery. So excellent reliability is a precondition or a prerequisite for providing excellent recovery. That's what this linkage signifies. Now, very quickly, this, this arrow here, this linkage, suggests that if you're consistently good in delivering the service, uh, uh, you know, what you're essentially doing, you're managing customers' expectations because you're buying more tolerance. You're buying more tolerance in the sense that if you're consistently good, you don't make very many mistakes, and the occasional mistake occurs, the customer might say, well, you know, this is probably not the company's fault because they're usually very, very good. <laughs> so you're actually buying tolerance, and buying to expanding the zone of tolerance is really good managing expectations. Managing expectations means buying some tolerance keeping expectations low, expanding that zone of tolerance. And providing reliable service contributes to that. And then uh, this arrow here also suggests that on the occasional instances when excellent recovery becomes necessary and you're able to deliver that wow type of service when a problem occurs, that actually can exceed a customer's expectations, right? So when a problem occurs, but the problem doesn't occur very often, but occasionally when it occurs, you pull out all stops as a company. You invest a lot of resources to really solve that problem very well. That creates this wow effect, where the customer really says, wow, I didn't expect that. They really took care of me, right? So this is a positive link. If you have excellent service recovery, that can actually help you exceed the customer's expectations. So those are the three basic service quality foundation building blocks. And very quickly to go up here, uh, then turning marketing into line function is something that we talked about. Going up here, uh, you know, good internal marketing simply has to do with marketing your company to your own employees. You know, improving the brand image or company image on the part of your employees is what good internal marketing is all about. And if you have good internal marketing, that makes the employees enthusiastic when they serve customers, right? So enthusiastic employees can practice good interactive marketing. And if you have good interactive marketing, that contributes to building customer loyalty. You know, customer loyalty, you know, if you have a lot of satisfied customers that keep coming back to you for business, uh, then those customers can actually also facilitate external marketing through word of mouth communication. So all of this logically follows based on what we have talked about. So if you need additional information on these things, <laughs> this is a little commercial, right? <laughs> there, are, there are these books, Techno Ready Marketing, you know, Clyde already mentioned, kindly. Uh, but there is also a website that you can check out. There is, uh, there is some information about technology and its role in, in delivering services. Um, uh, with that, I want to say thank you.
Uh, I hope I have planted some seeds or some ideas that will hopefully germinate into something useful uh, in your own uh, personal and professional careers. And I also want to thank Jane for doing, you know, just pitching in at the last minute and doing a superb job. Thank you. <laughs>